who I am. And uh, I'm, I'm uh, in the military okay. still. <laughs> I'm an aerospace medicine specialist. And I did a fellowship in underseen hyperbaric medicine as well at Duke University. Now I'm on the teaching staff over here at the Air Force uh, uh, School of Aerospace Medicine. And we have our hyperbaric medicine facility over at Wilford Hall. Uh, these are some of the objectives. I wasn't sure what the audience makeup was going to be. Sir, you mentioned you were a dentist and... Uh, I'm a geriatrician. Okay. Uh, so I uh, will try to focus on the things of interest. It's a small group. You guys can stop me anytime, ask any questions as we go. And if we don't make it through all the slides, that's okay. I'd rather just focus on what's of interest to you. Uh, if you're not familiar with hyperbaric oxygen therapy, hey, how you doing? Come on in. Have a seat. Uh, we're talking about a systemic therapy, not a topical therapy. There are some topical oxygen delivery systems out there that you, know, the, you can't extrapolate the literature from hyperbaric oxygen therapy as we describe it as systemic therapy to the topical. Uh, it's totally irrelevant. Have they in any way ever been proven efficacious to topical? No. To, 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 in my opinion, no, sir. <laughs> uh, it's a, we deliver 100% oxygen at, at higher than one atmosphere, typically between 1.8 atmospheres and three atmospheres absolute. Uh, so um, two to three times the uh, uh, pressure that we're experiencing in this room. And we can, if at, uh, we can achieve arterial oxygen tensions of over 1,000 millimeters of mercury easily and upwards of 2,000. Okay, and a healthy young person uh, we could probably get close to 2,400 as far as a PaO2, uh, something like that that you just could not do outside of the chamber. At these very high dosages, we're using uh, oxygen as a drug, okay? And the way we dose it is, is the pressure that we deliver it at and the amount of time that the person is exposed to. And the goal is to attain a, a therapeutic, you know, tissue level. Uh, this is an old cartoon, an old model. Uh, but basically, what we have done is we're trying to illustrate. Uh, this is on room air. This is um, room air in atmosphere of PaO2, about 100 millimeters of mercury, compared to what we have in hyperbaric conditions. And what we can, uh, what we're able to do is force or increase the diffusion distance of the oxygen fourfold by getting with well, the pressures up to up to that level on the arterial side. And on the venous side, we can actually increase the uh, distance that oxygen can, can diffuse by twice as far. And in fact, if you look at the, 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 the venous side of the, uh, of the uh, vasculature yeah, right. under hyperbaric conditions, we have the same amount of oxygen that you would typically see yeah, okay. on the arterial side just under room air. So this is just an illustration of how much uh, oxygen you gas through. Yes, sir. Nothing to do with the size of that. No, sir. Okay. No, it has nothing to do with the size of the vessel. It's, 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 we, we have a, a diffusion gradient now because the, the, the PO2 is so high in the arterial system, it can diffuse further into the tissues. It's, it's, a, high, it's a bigger driving force. Uh, the other thing that hyperbaric oxygen does, and it's a little counterintuitive at first, is that the high oxygen tensions causes vasoconstriction. And one would think, well, that's kind of counterproductive. Well, not really, because we're still getting very, very, very high partial pressures. We've still got that big driving force behind it. But uh, this vasoconstriction helps us get rid of edema. So we get the vessels closer together. So we're, we're going to be doing a greater good. Uh, in a very simplistic way, you know, here you've got a, uh, a capillary bed, and, and all the cells are close enough to, to the vessels to where they're adequately oxygenated. You get some edema pushes the vessels further apart, and you're going to get areas of relative hypoxia, you know, central. I still don't understand the, if you cause arterial constriction or both, or being, and by high oxygen yeah. tensions. And that's going to decrease the, the volume to the area and decrease edema? It, it decreases, we get, I've had patients, I've had, I've had surgeons uh, who have seen this decrease, this radical, this huge decrease in edema, refer patients to me simply to treat edema, and it's like, I'm sorry, I can't do that. I mean, it's a nice side effect, uh -huh. but it, it's not what we're there for. That's with a one-hour dye? You oh, see yeah. that with a one-hour dye? Oh, you, you'll see it almost immediately, you, very quickly. Very, you can see it very, very quickly. Uh, we, Mostly we, because you're decreasing the volume that's perfused yeah. to that area? Yes. Okay. Hmm. But the main thing is, is, the, uh, is that driving force of the, of the high uh, uh, 
oxygen tension in the vasculature. Normal tissue has a tissue oxygen tension of about 40 millimeters of mercury. Most of us are probably going to be closer to the 60s. It's higher centrally well, than it is uh, uh, peripherally if we were to compare. Uh, normal uh, tissue levels, uh, when they drop below 30 millimeters of mercury, will lead to, to uh, uh, poor functioning of fibroblast white cells and, and all the other cells. And the problem we see with, with, uh, in our patient population with many of these conditions is oxygen tensions below 30 millimeters of mercury in the tissue, okay, at the tissue level. So the, uh, and, uh, and consequently, they have issues healing. If we can restore normal oxygen tissue levels, we can preserve normalized cell function. I want to go over a little bit of history, because hyperbarics is, is not new. Uh, the concept of putting p uh, people in a pressurized uh, chamber dates back to the 1600s. Uh, and they used a bellows to pressurize it, and at that time it was just air. They, didn't, they hadn't discovered oxygen yet. Uh, in 1774, Priestley discovered oxygen. In 1800s, they first started using oxygen-enriched air. It was not 100% oxygen. They didn't have that capability. Um, and eventually, they started doing surgery in some of these pressurized chambers. And they found that they were able to administer a more profound anesthesia with a better safety margin uh, in, in this area. And this is you know, late 1800s, so it was nothing new. Unfortunately, it also turned into a very uh, stylish thing to do, and people set up various chambers making all kinds of ridiculous claims as far as beauty and health and, and whatnot. So uh, we started getting a bad reputation a long time ago. Uh, World War II, a fellow named Orville Cunningham was an anesthesiologist in Kansas City. Uh, he treated a colleague uh, during the Spanish flu pandemic uh, that was on the verge of death uh, from respiratory complications had a very good outcome, word got out. A very rich industrialist named Timken heard about it. He had chronic renal disease, went to, uh, to Dr. Cunningham, and Dr. Cunningham was treating just about everything under the sun with hyperbarics. Uh, this was his chamber. It was about, uh, if I remember correctly, 80 or 90 feet long. It was a rather large cylindrical chamber. Treated Mr. Timken. Timken got better for whatever reason. Okay, I don't have a good scientific explanation why hyperbarics would have helped him. Uh, but he was so grateful, he funded and built this giant sphere, which was five stories tall. It had private rooms, dining facilities, he even had a smoking room at the top. And you can imagine how the smoking room in this oxygen-rich environment is a bad idea. Uh, and it was connected to the main cylinder. The AMA got on Dr. Cunningham, you know, basically because he was a Not about the smoking room, though. No. There were still physicians making advertisements, and, but uh, got on him for that, and they called him on it, and they said, look, they basically shut him down in the 1930s, and his chambers ended up getting melted during World War II for, for, for his arms, ships, guns, whatever. Uh, and the interest in hyperbarics kind of went away in this country. It doesn't stop with, with Dr. Cunningham, though. Even today... Even today, there are people out there making all kinds of ridiculous claims about hyperbarics, how it can restore hair loss and various other things. But this is something hyperbarics will not do. Okay. Uh, this is our chamber facility here at Brook City Base. This chamber is, from a historical perspective, 1903, using the construction of the Panama Canal. Uh, these chambers over here were built in the 1950s to support uh, uh, our high-altitude flights and NASA early on before NASA had a space department. This is a small, older, 24-inch, you know, monoplace chamber over here. Now, these are still down there, or they're yes. Wilford Hall? No, these chambers are still down there. But you're not using them? Yes, we are. We're using oh. them for our research protocols. Oh, okay. Uh, and currently we're doing, I'll just jump ahead, uh, looking at the potential of TBI and hyperbaric oxygen therapy uh, to see if perhaps that, that will help. This is, our, uh, this is not our chamber, but this is just like our chamber at Wilford Hall. Uh, this is a rectangular chamber, it's no longer cylindrical. It's built in Australia. The one at Wilford Hall is the first one in this country that was set up and became operational. Uh, they, they're installing one just like this at, uh, in Salt Lake City uh, and also at uh, the famous place, uh, the Mayo Clinic. Oh, yeah. Okay. Uh, and this is a little more comfortable. It's not as, uh, people tolerate it better than the, being in a cylinder. And we deliver oxygen via a hood which we flood with uh, 30 liter liters a minute of 100% uh, oxygen, or a tight-fitting aviator's mask, anesthesia-type mask, where we can get sufficient flow and volume uh, to deliver 100% oxygen. 
Uh, we also have a very large, nice mono place chamber. This is 40 inches in diameter compared to the older 24 inch chambers. And it's got a nice uh, uh, TV monitor, stereo system. Patients can lay in there and watch movies. It's very comfortable. If I was the patient, I would rather be laying down in here than sitting up in the chamber. And just out of curiosity, uh, this is a transportable <laughs> Kevlar chamber that uh, we can use for emergency transport of patients should they need to. Uh, frankly, the military bought a whole bunch of these dozens and dozens, and we really have utilized, utilized them very, very little. We're still trying to figure out a, a good a good use for these. So if you had a contaminated potential uh, tetanus in the field or, or CO2 poisoning or whatever? Or well, we could, but you can imagine that the, the, the ends, which you can't see, are acrylic, so you can actually see in through the ends, but there's no windows along the way. So yeah. really, the only patient you're going to get in there, and first, secondly, sticking a patient in there is quite difficult. I mean, the patient needs to be helping you get in. He needs to be able to help himself. You're not going to get a too terribly ill patient in there, but one example might be, and it's happened to us before, uh, we've got a patient with decompression sickness in a remote area. The only way out is to fly him out to a regular treatment chamber, and we don't want to expose him to another decompression in an aircraft, so we could stick him in here, pressurize him, and not have to worry about that. Uh, initially, it came out, again, just another curiosity thing. It came out as an emergency evacuation stretcher, not a hyperbaric chamber for treatment. Uh, it, they didn't want to go through all the hoops, FDA approval and whatnot. Since then, they have gone back and actually have been certified to deliver a treatment. And, and we certainly could. A civilian, a civilian community at all uh, actually, it was initially developed for, for the offshore oil rig oh, okay. uh, you know, population. More for decompression. Sick, diving decompression, exactly. Right, not for other things. Right. And we get decompression sickness not just from our divers, but also from our high altitude flyers. Uh -huh. Hey, just a little physiology. Um, could you can I hit enter? Sure, sure. You, you guys know the little uh, hemoglobin, the uh, oxygen uh, dissociation curve. Can you hit next? Uh, you know, here we are. You know, uh, sitting here at room air next. And then on the venous side, if you did it, it'd probably drop down into the you know between 70 and 80 range. If we change uh, you know uh, percent oxygenation to the content of oxygen in blood. Arterial blood, you get about 20 uh, mLs of oxygen per 100 mLs of blood, and the venous side about 15. So we're actually consuming about 5 to 6 mLs of oxygen per 100 you know, mLs of blood for our normal basal metabolic uh, rate. And this is all stored on the hemoglobin. There's very, very little oxygen dissolved in plasma. Next, please. Uh, next. Oh, next. And as you can see here, uh, here we are at room air. We uh, you know, pressurize a chamber. But our hemoglobin is already saturated in this room. Sticking in the chamber, I'm not going to put any more oxygen on hemoglobin. So where does the oxygen go? Next, please. We've got very little in the plasma. What I'm doing is I'm loading oxygen into the plasma, which is exactly where it needs to be. Uh, even the hemo oxygen on hemoglobin doesn't you know good until it's released into the plasma and can diffuse across the uh, uh, blood vessel. Next, please. And if, it's hard to see on the slide, but the oxygen content here is about five to six mLs, you know, per 100 mLs of, uh, of blood, next, which is enough to sustain life. This is Dr. Ite Buerma, uh, a Dutch physician, cardiothoracic surgeon, late 50s, before the invention of the cardiothoracic bypa uh, bypass pump. They were looking at ways to extend OR times and improve outcomes in, in uh, uh, cardiothoracic surgery. And he had the idea of, gee, can we do surgery in a hyperbaric environment and achieve what will what, what his goal? Uh, next, please. He published a paper, uh, early 60s, Life Without Blood, which is actually a, a pig-based model. But next, please. And this should start playing. It did earlier. OK. An experimental effect shows that life without blood is possible under hyperbaric conditions. Pigs breathing pure oxygen at 3 eta are totally exsanguined. The lighting is poor, but the pig is pale, trust me. They replaced the fluid volume. They're in a hyperbaric chamber. There was enough oxygen dissolved in the fluid that replaced the uh, blood to sustain uh, its basal metabolic. The you know, fluid was saline? Yes, you know, sir. I'll be honest. I don't. Yeah. I don't know what the fluid was, but essentially, oh. any we would be able to get enough oxygen into solution. Any? Huh. Uh, exactly. You know what? Sometimes if you don't. 
There it goes. Oh. This is just a little historical picture of Dr. Jeff Davis, uh, who was in this country the father of modern you know, hyperbaric medicine, was in the Air Force, and uh, in the uh, uh, 60s and early 70s, really uh, is the guy who reestablished clinical hyperbarics uh, in this country, and that's his early team. Next, please. And uh, Dr. Heimbach followed him as, as the uh, head of the department over at the uh, School of Air Force, uh, uh, Air Force School of uh, Aerospace Medicine. But the, the important things that well, they did was back, uh, they, they, they published uh, through the Underseen Hyperbaric Medical Society the acceptable indications for hyperbaric medicine. Uh, and that eventually became incorporated in, into, uh, uh, by HICFA. And it's been the uh, source of reimbursement for most of third-party insurance companies uh, in this country. The, the criteria what they put out initially was actually quite liberal. Uh, there were dozens and dozens of accepted indications. Uh, again, we came under a lot of scrutiny uh, in the 90s and, and uh, around 2000, and they were revised, and we're down to about 13 indications, which is what we'll talk about here shortly. Next, please. Uh, different mechanisms of action, we don't have time to go into them in detail, but there's the pressure effects oxygen diffusion that we talked about earlier, and that's mostly important when we're talking about uh, decompression sickness and treating uh, uh, arterial gas embolism. Uh, but we can hyperoxygenate tissue, we cause some vasoconstriction, get rid of edema. Uh, in irradiated tissue, previously irradiated tissue that, that has undergone the late effects of radiation, we can induce neovascularization. Okay, we don't induce neovascularization in normal tissue. Uh, we Chronic uh, wounds, one of the problems you have in chronic wounds is an imbalance between the inflammatory cytokines and the growth factors. And what hyperbaric oxygen uh, has been shown to do, it can downregulate the inflammatory cytokines, help upregulate the uh, growth factors, and, and help with problem wounds. Uh, leukocytes uh, function poorly in a low oxygen tension environment. Uh, that's a very important mechanism for, for many reasons, but it can improve leukocyte function and also has a direct effect on some bacteria, you know, primarily anaerobic bacteria, uh, as far as killing and stasis of organisms. Uh, next, please. We do have some limitations. We're not going to go into them into great length because these are very rarely seen and typically not a problem as far as limiting the use of hybrid oxygen therapy. But there is CNS toxicity. If I put any of you in a chamber uh, at two atmospheres, absolute or greater, and leave you there long enough, you will have a seizure if you're breathing 100% oxygen. It's just a matter of time. The higher the pressure, the shorter the amount of time I can stick you in the chamber. But we can mitigate that by giving you air breaks. We take the oxygen off and just give you air and then put the lid back on later. So we, using intermittent air breaks, we can mitigate CNS toxicity. So what is your protocol? I'll show you at the end. Uh, if I fail to bring it up, remind me at the end. Uh, pulmonary oxygen toxicity is not a threshold event the way CNS toxicity is. Pulmonary toxicity is, is more of a cumulative event. Uh, consequently, on our patients, we don't see pulmonary toxicity unless that patient is going back to the unit and is being put on a ventilator at very, very high flows of O2 while they're not in the chamber. And typically, we're not treating those patients. We do see it in our decompression sickness patients, our divers, who are getting very extended recompression therapy, which can last six hours, eight hours, 12 hours for severe uh, uh, decompression sickness. But again, it's totally reversible uh, by, by getting them out of that environment. Uh, barotrauma is actually very common, but it's quite minimal. Ears and sinuses are, of course, the uh, most common. And in some patients, we actually just have to get a, uh, uh, put in PE tubes or do a meringotomy uh, if they're unable to equalize their, their, their ears. Uh, sinuses would, would be the next most common barotrauma. Again, it's a minor complication. You can have discomfort, you know, barotrauma in the gut, a tooth, uh, any place where you may have trapped air, uh, but, but that's really not a limiting factor. Uh, delivery system, some people just get claustrophobic, can't tolerate a chamber, or they can't tolerate, if even in a multi-place chamber, just may not tolerate a hood or wearing a mask, or they may have a physical defect or abnormality that precludes uh, wearing that, that device. We get very creative sometimes taping hoods on the people's chests and back and you know, elaborate trying to accommodate them, but sometimes uh, we just can't. Uh, patient that will, will discomfort, uh, again, usually it's anxiety. Uh, and myopia is a very minor problem. We only see it after the patient's received on the order of 30 treatments or more. 
uh, and it is fully reversible. In 90, you know, a very, very high percentage of cases, over 95% are be fully uh, uh, reversible when they discontinue hyperbaric oxygen therapy, though it may take four to six weeks to fully reverse. And even if it doesn't, it's an easily fixed problem by, by wearing spectacles. This is just a laundry list of the approved indications. I break them into two categories, acute and non-acute, but we're gonna, uh, I've got more slides coming up listing all of these, so we'll just move on for the sake of time. Next, uh, okay, that's uh, arterial gas embolism is, uh, we see it in, in divers, in uh, anyone who's undergone a, a decompression stress, high altitude flyers, etc. But we also see it uh, iatrogenically in, in uh, hospitals. Uh, it's been associated with a laundry list. I didn't bring a list of all the different procedures, but there's certainly a laundry list of, uh, uh, I had, I have, during my fellowship training, I had a fellow who had a gastroesophageal strictures. He was undergoing a, a dial, a, some sort of di a dilatory procedure. They were using compressed gas. He ended up uh, getting tears in his esophagus. Air somehow entered into his vasculature, uh, and he was sent to us with, with a, a massive, you know, AGE. Certainly, you'll see it in cardiothoracic surgery. It's really amazing how common this is. And if you look carefully here, the, you know, what you see is you're, you're seeing a sequence of little bubbles in that vessel. And they just block the flow. Uh, so you, you'll get uh, uh, an ischemic event. Uh, next. Uh, carbon monoxide poisoning, we treat this acutely. Uh, the reason to treat carbon monoxide poisoning, this is not, this is not the standard of care. The standard of care, is, as most of you know, is uh, just a, a high flow, 100% you know, oxygen. Uh, but there's always, a, in significant exposures, there's about a 20 or 25 percent chance of developing a chronic neurologic sequela. Uh, it's hard to predict who's going to develop it. We really have no, no way of doing that. And for these higher exposures, uh, there's some uh, very good literature showing that the use of hyperbaric oxygen therapy can decrease the risk of developing chronic neurologic sequela. Uh, next, please. In the dog suit that she had. What dog? Isn't that a picture of it? Oh, no. What is that? <laughs> Sharon. <laughs> okay. What is that? You know, what right is that? that is a little, it's a little, it's a little black baby boy. <gasps> <laughs> oh, it yeah. is. Yes, it's an infant. Oh. This is, this is a nurse. She's the wife of a friend of mine in South Africa. Mm -hmm. And, uh. She laid down with him. Yes. This is a monoplace chamber. So the whole chamber is flooded with oxygen so they don't have to wear hoods. This little, uh, but, uh, no, <laughs> but in this case, I, uh, I take that back. And what they did in this case was, well, they reversed it. They, they pressurized with oxygen so she wouldn't be exposed, uh, with air, so she wouldn't be exposed to the oxygen because we don't want her seizing in the chamber yeah. when she's taking care of the kid. And the kid's getting oxygen via a high-flow mask. In a multi-place chamber, what I have done is with, with small children, I've actually taken two hoods and stuck the child inside of the hood and take two hoods together uh, and made the little oxygen, made a little individualized chamber for, 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 for the small child. But then you pressurize the larger chamber with yes. air. Yes, But exactly. you, still, you still achieve the goal of increasing the right. partial they, they, pressure. Exactly. See, from here, it looks like I, a dachshund. It's hard to see. <laughs> well, it's, it's very, when I first saw the picture, I had no idea what it was. And I looked at it for a long time. It's like, Franz, what is this? Uh, Okay, I, 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 thought she, I thought she was the patient. <laughs> it's like, no, that's my wife. <laughs> okay, decompression sickness we're really not going to talk about because uh, I want to focus on the things that, that, that you might see here. Gas gangrene we don't see a whole lot in this country. It's actually very common in, in the Netherlands. It's very common in South Africa uh, because of the, of the prevalence of the organism in the soil in those areas and a lot of motor vehicle trauma and, and contaminated wounds with soil. But gas gangrene is, is an indication uh, for hyperbaric oxygen therapy. What, what it does, we, uh, not only is it, it, it the organism, an anaerobe, and hyperbaric oxygen therapy uh, helps kill the organism, but even before it does that, it will terminate the, 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 the production of a lot of the toxins that, that cause problems in, in gangrene. Uh, next. Acute traumatic ischemias. You know, the big, the big issue here, one of the big issues, is you get, you can have that ischemia reperfusion phenomenon when, when you reestablish, you know, flow and connect things together. And hyperbaric oxygen therapy 
uh, can break that ischemia reperfusion injury cycle. Okay, so basically it can uh, reversibly inhibit the beta-2 integrins, so it keeps the, the, the white cells from attaching to the cell wall and, and migrating through the uh, vasculature into the tissue and causing some of that secondary injury. So you're talking about people that are actually have, have traumatic amputations that are reconnected? Or? That would be a, an example, but basically any time where, where, where you've had an acute you know, ischemia and you've reestablished uh -huh. flow, hyperbaric oxygen therapy uh, is, is an approved indication and can be utilized. Can you get somebody into the chamber fast enough in some that's, settings? Well, and that's the problem. One of the problems with hyperbaric oxygen therapy is it's, it's not available everywhere. And unless you have it in-house, you're probably not going to be able to use it. Uh, and with the exception of, excuse me, arterial gas embolism and decompression sickness, uh, it, it is not primary therapy. It is just adjuvant therapy. And it's never used uh, to replace the primary therapy. Okay. Uh, but if it's available, it's something to think about. For uh, the, the decompression sickness, I mean, if you like go down, yes. and kind of a lot of pressure inside, and eventually you get pulmonary edema because everything mm -hmm. comes. No, in. with decompression sickness, very briefly, if and if you're interested, we can talk some more afterwards. But right now, uh, we're breathing 21% oxygen and 78% nitrogen. Nitrogen, for all practical purposes in the body, is an inert gas. We don't metabolize it. We don't do anything with it. Okay, it's inert, uh, and we are sitting right now at equilibrium we are saturated at this given pressure with nitrogen. If we go scuba diving or go to an environment of increased pressure, uh, you get rupture, you no, you don't get rupture. What happens is when you go to the increased pressure with, with decompression sickness is you're now unloading nitrogen. You, you've got to achieve a new equilibrium uh, at that pressure. So you are, you are adding more nitrogen to your tissues. You, the longer you stay down there, the more nitrogen gets on board, okay? Now, once you come from that pressurized environment and you surface and you decrease the pressure, that nitrogen has to be released. And if you release it too quickly, well, not just crepitus, but uh, uh, it, it, decompression sickness is a very odd, it, it, bubbles are, are associated with decompression sickness. Bubbles probably have a role in decompression sickness. Uh, but there's, uh, we, we don't have a lot of conclusive hard evidence as to the exact pathophysiology of what's involved. Uh, and, and some of it is bubbles, but there's also other issues that, 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 that come up. But essentially, we start off gassing, it's like a Coke. If, if you open up a Coke too quickly, and you release the uh, pressure on that Coke too quickly, all the bubbles will come out of solution. The same thing in our body. If we achieve a higher, uh, uh, go to a higher pressure, get a new equilibrium, lots of nitrogen on board, and we take the pressure off too quickly, then, those, then that gas will be released too quickly for our bodies to, to deal with it. That's decompression sickness. Now, you were talking about uh, uh, you know, pulmonary barotrauma, you know, AGE. That is, to keep it simple, a separate malady. Uh, and that, th there's, uh, the primary way is going to be through pulmonary barotrauma. Uh, and, and that's just more of, uh, I'm holding my uh, breath at depth, and as I come up and release the pressure, I have a closed glottis, and the air is expanding inside my lungs, but just all, you know, that air volume, the volume in my chest is expanding. Eventually, it's going to rupture, okay? And that's a mechanism to get the AGE that well, you're talking about. There, there's different illnesses, but that's a whole other, I could spend a couple of hours talking about decompression sickness and AGE. And I don't imagine that you see too much of that here at the VA. <laughs> okay, next please. Well, Let's hung up on something. Well, we'll probably get like six minutes of it. Now, with, with necrotizing fasciitis, the uh, literature... Uh, oh, that's okay, you can leave it there. <laughs> the uh, necrotizing... Fa let's just leave it. Okay. The uh, necrotizing fasciitis... Um, I think the literature is, is, is quite good and supportive for necrotizing fasciitis. It comes under a lot of criticism, but I think it's from people that don't really understand and read the papers closely enough. The problem with a lot of the things that we use hyperbaric oxygen therapy for is that they're fairly unique, extreme you know, cases. And they're very, very hard to get a large enough case, number of cases where you can control for everything. So we tend to lump necrotizing fasciitis and say, okay, these are all necrotizing fasciitis. 
Well, necrotizing fasciitis is different. If it presents on the trunk, you know, can be quite more severe and life-threatening than if it was on an extremity. And depending on what you're measuring as an endpoint, you know, you may or may not show, you know, a difference. But uh, from personal experience and having treated numerous necrotizing fasciitis in the chamber, this is another one of those things where you can see dramatic improvement just right before your eyes, just like we talked about the edema reduction earlier in many cases. I have literally seen necrotizing fasciitis where the erythema, the edema, was just, you can just see it receding right before your, your very eyes. And the patient who was on the verge of becoming unstable, all of a sudden stabilizing and, and becoming quite stable. Uh, and I've seen very, very mild necrotizing fasciitis going to the chamber uh, that probably didn't need to go. Uh, but yet, I, I think we, we, we helped, and I've seen some other very severe cases that, uh, you know, they've already had extensive multiple debridements, you know, extensive surgeries, you know, triple antibiotics, IV, you know, uh, uh, IG, and we're still spiraling down, and it wasn't until we stuck them in the chamber that they turned around. Uh, so, I'm, I'm, to me, it's almost more like a religious kind of conversion. I'm a believer, and I think the literature is actually quite good on it. Exceptional blood loss anemia, I've never treated anybody like it. I'm sorry? Exceptional yeah. <laughs> we'll Exceptional we'll, we'll blood loss anemia, I've never treated someone with that, but uh, you can see that a couple times, either somebody who doesn't want blood, well, blood products, uh, or you're having trouble you know, typing and cross-matching matching somebody or getting blood. Well, obviously if they're, too, if they're so anemic, you can actually get you know, uh, EKG changes, you can have you know, organ system uh, you know, a dysfunction and injury uh, if, if, they're, if they're profoundly anemic. Uh, by sticking them in the chamber, we're just buying time. Uh, and it is, is my approach to it. One of the interesting things that well, has also been, well, been shown, we can't keep them in the chamber for very long because of oxygen toxicity. Somebody like that, we end up bringing back three or four times a day for an hour or two at a time, if need be. Uh, but it has also been shown that we can increase red cell production and if, they, if they're not going to get blood products at all, get their hematocrit up more quickly uh, by using hyperic oxygen therapy. Those are very unusual cases and, and, there's, and it's not a big indication. Acute thermal injuries, I'll be honest with you, all that what was based on, uh, on old literature. Uh, back in the 60s and the 70s, before we started doing wide excisions uh, and early uh, grafting of burns, uh, I am not an advocate of using hyperic oxygen therapy in acute thermal injuries. Uh, however, I'll caveat that with, for the more, for the chronic or, uh, you know, and complications from thermal injuries, infection, you know, graft rejection, et cetera, uh, I, would, I would be uh, an advocate for, for using it next. So you need, none of the burn units have uh, chambers? They don't have one over here? Not, not here, sir, no. But uh, in um, Augusta, Georgia, Medical College of Georgia, uh, I'm not sure if they're still doing it, but for a while they were very big on using hyperic oxygen therapy. Even acutely, not, not yes. just for you're talking about the chronic Correct. Wound, yeah. Correct. But, you know, ironically, for, for most of the things that hyperic oxygen works for, it work, it, it, you can show a difference or show benefit for the more extreme, severe, you know, really sick people. And uh, I'll, there'll be a good example of that coming up here shortly. Consequently, on the burns, it was it was it, they were advocating on these uh, really severe, extensive burns. Well, those are usually complicated, multi-trauma patients who are very unstable, and sticking them in the chamber, unless you do it routinely, is something very that's very very difficult to do. And certainly, even though I'm an experienced hyperbaric uh, uh, physician, I, I'm not you know I don't feel feel qualified to do that. I wouldn't want to do it. Uh, compromised grafts and flaps. We will talk about here uh, coming up. Basically, we can use it two ways. One, in previously irradiated tissue, and I'll show you some examples, uh, we can prepare the site uh, with hyperic oxygen therapy, and that's well accepted. Uh, you obviously don't want to graft into previously irradiated tissue, because if you've seen uh, previously irradiated tissue, it's had a heavy dose. It's, it's hypovascular, hypocellular, it's, uh, uh, very, it's scar tissue, basically. Okay, it's not going to take. We can also use it to salvage a threatened graft or flap, but this indication was originally meant for the acute, hyperacute setting where you put a graft on the flap on this morning and you go up in the afternoon to check your flap and, it's, and you, you're, there's, it's dusky, you're concerned about the viability of the flap. That's when it was intended for. 
this has evolved and you'll see that most of the patients that we get for threatened flaps are 10 days down the road, 12 days down the road, uh, a little bit different. But clearly, in the acute setting, you want to relieve any hypoxia, minimize, we, we can minimize the ischemia or reperfusion injuries we talked about. Uh, we can improve micro, microvascular uh, uh, blood flow and improve overall wound healing. Uh, next, please. Uh, if you have a threatened flap, you want to do surgical correction. We're just adjuvant therapy. We don't replace everything else. Clearly, if there's a threatened flap, why is it threatened? You know, is the pedicle twisted? Is there a hematoma? Is there some other obstruction that you can fix surgically? That needs to happen first. And then clearly we can use hyperbaric oxygen therapy as adjuvant. Uh, this is more of what we see on, on a regular basis. And it's not really what the initial intent was when we said threatened flap. Uh, but we get a lot of uh, diabetics, lower extremity amputations. And uh, typically what we see, if, if on these type of uh, uh, wounds, if I, uh, I'm not comfortable or I don't feel good about them having healed until they're about two weeks out. Because typically if it's going to fail, we see it failing at, at 10 to 14 days. But the reason it's failing, it's either going to be, you know, poor blood flow to start with, it's not, maybe not, not the best site to cut at, uh, or infection, okay, or some other issue. And at this point what we're just trying to do is salvage you know, tissue in the surrounding area and trying to get it to heal in by, by, by secondary intention. Uh, but that's what, typically what, what people call a uh, threatened flap nowadays. Problem wounds, the prototypical one is a uh, diabetic foot ulcer. This gentleman here has the exact kind of ulcer that we like to treat between his uh, great toe and the second toe. And we'll discuss this at the very end if we have time, which is uh, transcutaneous oxygen uh, uh, monitoring. Uh, but the prototypical wound is a diabetic foot ulcer. Uh, is an approved indication and it is reimbursable by third party payers. We do see some other problem wounds that fall into various categories that we typically do not treat with hyperbaric oxygen therapy, but which we may, under extenuating circumstances and careful evaluation, if nothing else has worked. Okay. Uh, next. Typically, you don't get reimbursed for those. Uh, the rules for engagement are actually kind of interesting, I think. Obviously, for a diabetic foot ulcer, the patient has to have diabetes. They have to have a Wagner Cianci grade three or higher. If you're not familiar with it, I'll describe what, what that scale is on, on the next slide, but it's a pretty significant wound. Uh, and the patient has failed an adequate course of wound therapy for at least 30 days. Okay, so we're not throwing every patient in there. In the Department of Defense, we're, we don't really capture third party payments. Okay, so we're not terribly, uh, too terribly concerned if we're gonna get paid or not because it's irrelevant. Uh, and we don't necessarily uh, wait this long to treat patients if they fit with hyperbaric oxygen therapy. But the one thing I, I would like to point out with diabetic foot wounds is, to me, there's two types of diabetic foot wounds. There's the one I showed you on the dorsum of the foot, which is typically ischemic, okay, uh, and hypoxic. Then there's the one on the plantar surface. The one on the plantar surface, generally speaking, is not ischemic. It could be, but generally it's not. The problem with that wound is exactly. it's neuropathic, he's got anatomic deformities, uh, and, uh, uh, and, and ischemia is not a problem. Infection might be a problem, there may be some other issues involved. And with those wounds, if you do good pressure relief, good wound care, uh, since it's not ischemic, hypoxic, you don't need hyperic oxygen therapy. But yet we see a lot of those patients going, going into the chamber elsewhere. We, I don't tend to stick them in the chamber. Uh, next, please. The, the grading scale, uh, it's kind of interesting because on a grade three, it has to penetrate uh, basically uh, down into the, uh, you know, uh, uh, you got to have tendon or bone or the joint. Okay, it's got to be that deep. And it has to have infection. Okay, and only at that point is it a grade three and can we, st we, we can stick it in the chamber and get reimbursed by a third party payers. So it's, it's a pretty extreme wound, uh, sadly. Uh, grade four, it's not worth sticking into the chamber because you've got dead tissue, okay? I cannot resurrect dead tissue. What's adequate or standard wound care therapy? Well, we want it to go on for at least 30 days. You gotta have a proper assessment of vascular status. If the person has vascular compromise and is a good candidate for vascular bypass, that needs to happen first, okay? If you think about my systemic oxygen therapy, 
if you don't get blood flow to the area, I don't get oxygen to the area, and it's not going to work. Okay. So ideally, we would correct any vascular problems if possible. If not, we go into understanding that hyperbaric oxygen will be, will be limited uh, in its effects. And we have ways uh, of using our transcutaneous oxygen me measurements to predict uh, the ability uh, of the wound to heal if we were to stick it in the chamber. You've got to optimize on nutrition, glucose control, you've got to debride the wound, use a, maintain a well, a good, clean, moist wound bed, appropriate offloading, and treat any infection. You do all that for 30 days. And if at 30 days you show no improvement, then the patient is a candidate for hyperbaric oxygen therapy based on the current uh, third party payer rules. I yes? Go ahead. Oh, okay. Uh, chronic refractory osteomyelitis is something else that, that uh, uh, we have pretty good uh, success with. And we'll go, you know what, uh, just the differentiate between acute, chronic, and refractory, we only treat or should be treating chronic refractory osteomyelitis. Okay. And that's because it's very different from acute. And chronic refractory for us is you've undergone uh, a, a, an honest to goodness, you know, uh, first class attempt to eradicate the, what would be infection surgically through antibiotics or both, and the infection persists uh, uh, for longer than six months. Okay, next. We're just adjuvant therapy. This is what acute osteomyelitis looks like, which is very different from, from chronic, which is more of a diffuse type of infectious process, uh, and it, it's just very, very different. Uh, next, please. And the difference, you'll see clusters of bacteria. It's usually polymicrobial. Uh, you've got uh, hypovascular, hypoxic bone. The oxygen tension is, is too low, okay, to, to promote good function of the white cells, osteoclasts, osteoblasts, and fibroblasts. Consequently, the body just can't clean itself and rid itself of this infection. Uh, next. Uh, we've had pretty good success. With, with these chronic refractory patients. But again, when, when we're treating them, we're not using hyperbaric oxygen therapy as a monotherapy. We're just an adjunct. So they're, they're still getting surgery or an, and or antibiotics. It's being aggressively treated. We're just adding hyperbaric oxygen therapy uh, uh, to the mix. Uh, just this is a pathological slide of, uh, you can see how it's a very diffuse you know, process here. You've got multiple abscesses uh, in the shaft of the bone. And you can see in this x-ray where you, you've, instead of being a very focal process, you can see that you've got a, a, a lot of stuff going on here. But you can see it's also extending quite a, quite the, there's a big reactive process going up this way. Okay, it's, it's very different from an acute osteomyelitis. Uh, delayed effects of radiation. The classic one was as osteoradial necrosis of the jaw in patients who had tumors of the head and neck and received uh, uh, radiation. Uh, next. Uh, with radiation, you get acute effects like a thermal injury, a burn, okay, and that typically resolves within weeks or a couple of months, and the tissue looks normal, okay. But the tissue's been damaged. And different, depending on the dose and depending on the individual and their sensitivity to that radiation, they're on a bit of a downward slope, okay. That tissue is slowly degrading over time. Some are on a, on a steeper slope than others. I have seen the late effects of radiation as early as three months, which is very, very, very unusual. Okay, but, the, but these are very, apparently patients that just had a very low tolerance, you know, for it. And I've had other patients, because of our increased, uh, you know, life uh, expectancy, I've got a little old lady with chronic osteomyelitis of, uh, of some ribs in her sternum, who is in her 80s, who is 40 years out from her, uh, radiation therapy, and she never had a wound before, but now she does, okay, 40 years. What the radiation does, it causes an end arteritis, and you, and you get a hypovascular, hypocellular bed, you get a lot of fibrosis, as I mentioned, it's a continuum. The complications in the irradiated bed typically are precipitated by a second insult, okay, either infection, surgery, or trauma. In my 80-year-old lady, she basically had an actinic keratosis. She went to go see her internal medicine doctor. They went to go freeze it off, not realizing it was over this previously irradiated field. They gave her a small wound, which turned into a big problem. 
Same thing happens in, in your dental patients. Uh, you know, initially, it's a very interesting story because the guy who discovered this is, was a former Air Force maxillofacial surgeon, uh, uh, Dr. Marks. He was here in San Antonio. And up until that point, they had been treating these patients as uh, chronic osteomyelitis of the jaw. And they were treating with antibiotics. They weren't getting any better. And he said, well, gee, maybe this is something else. And he fell upon this uh, uh, osteoradionecrosis necrosis uh, of the jaw. And I'll show you some of his data and what he did here shortly. But because of his work and success in treating osteoradionecrosis uh, of the jaw, you know, you just can't extrapolate data from one tissue to another. And the only really good studies that we had from going lab animals to humans is in the jaw. But we have treated many patients with laryngeal necrosis. There's a, an excellent case series of over 100 patients uh, with laryngeal necrosis. I have personally treated patients with laryngeal necrosis and had very good results. Uh, we've treated many soft tissue wounds. A lot of radiation cystitis and proctitis. Unfortunately, we don't get these patients until it's very late in their course of their illness. I have seen patients who have gone to stellar medical institutions, you know, Johns Hopkins, uh, the Mayo Clinic, the Cleveland Clinic, and uh, their urologist, well, you know, we'll do all this other stuff first, and then do, if that doesn't work, we'll do hyperbaric oxygen therapy. Well, you know, by the time you've gone in there and you've tried sclerotherapy and you turned this bladder into leather, okay, there's not much I can do for you, okay. Uh, I'd rather see them earlier than later. I've gotten very good success with all of those. We've tried it with radiation neuropathies and brain injury, and frankly, that has proven very, very hard to treat. Okay, I, and my, my personal success has not been great, and there's not much in the literature. Uh, next, please. This is, one of our, this is one of my ladies who has not been a success. Uh, when I first got here, I saw her, and it's like, you know, I've treated lots of patients like you. We've had good success. We might be able to help you. You know, four years later, we're still messing with that dog on wound. Uh, we're no longer doing hyperbaric oxygen therapy. We're just doing chronic wound care. And it's, this is too big an area. Uh, and she is an older lady, albeit in good health, uh, where we can't, uh, the plastic surgeons don't want to touch it as far as well, we're, we're putting a flap on there. Uh, this is a gentleman. I did not see him at this stage. This was 10, 15 years ago. He had head and neck radiation. After his radiation, uh, they wanted to go in there and do a flap. Okay. Uh, not surprisingly, the flap failed. You can see a little bit of the flap preserved here. He had a big wound. He got pretreated with, with hyperbaric oxygen therapy to induce some re to get some neovascularization, normalize all that tissue, and he had this. Uh, he had a second surgery and healed, except for a little area. Actually, this was about half as big. And 15 years later, I see him because he didn't want to go back and get that little wound taken care of. It was about the size of a quarter. He was happy with it. He didn't care. 20 years later, it started getting bigger again. So he came back to see us, and we pre-treated him. And I don't have a second picture, but they grafted him over. He did fine. Okay. And in the dental community, if, you don't pre if you've got a patient who's had more, who's had more than 6,500 rads of uh, radiation to the head and neck, to the jaw area, they're at very high risk of developing osteoradial necrosis. I think the next slide shows you a picture. There it is. This is a panorex. You'll see it's a you know, it's a uh, lucent areas, hypodense bone, pathologic fractures, abscesses, lots of dental caries. What happens is you not only nuke the bone, but you took out the salivary glands. So they got a lot of uh, you know dry mouth. They have trouble eating. Poor nutritional status. Can't swallow. They don't have enough saliva to wash away all the bacteria and crud from, from their teeth. They're at high risk of caries. Eventually, either because of the caries or dental extractions and whatnot, they get that secondary trauma and they get this, this big chain of events for uh, osteoradio uh, uh, necrosis. What the dental community now does by and large is if they've had a high uh, dose of radiation previously, before they go in for any dental work, they'll send them over to us and we pre-treat them. And I'll show you here briefly how we can uh, induce some neovascularization and normalize with that tissue. They'll tell you. If, if back in the old days, before hyperbaric oxygen therapy, you, you pulled a tooth, there was no bleeding, all sorts of 80%, 90% complications. Nowadays, after hyperbarics, you pull a tooth, it looks more like normal tissue, it bleeds, it heals better, if, and far, far, far fewer complications. Uh, so we use it prophylactically, and we also use it to treat, to try to treat some of those extensive cases as well. This is a rabbit study that Dr. Marks did, and make a long story short, 
this is on air, this is just uh, breathing 100% oxygen on, uh, at surface level, no pressure. This is in a hyperbaric chamber after numerous treatments. And you can show, using micro, micro angiographic vascular density, that we have induced new vasculature into that, into that tissue. Yes, so they just put people in a tube and then they, you put the oxygen in there at the high pressure? Is that how it works or is it just applied to the air? No, no. It's systemic. It's okay. yes. They, they have to be in a pressurized environment breathing 100% oxygen. Is yes. there a TV in there? So yes. Sure. You, anytime you want to come visit, we'll, 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 we can go in there. and watch TV. <laughs> Another little cartoon, but at the periphery of the wound, you've got normal tissues, you approach a center, very, very low oxygen tensions. Next. Oh. Oh, sorry. Well, <laughs> after, after several, this is after 18 to 24 treatments, we've induced some blood vessel growth. We're starting to approach normal oxygen tensions in the tissue. And the next slide is, what, is where, where the proof is. These are the, the controls. These, are, these were the, the patients uh, who were, had been irradiated. The oxygen tension in the bone in these patients was down in the 30 level, which is below the 40 that we like to see. During the first six or seven treatments, there's not much change. And then all of a sudden, you get in the steep part of the curve, and they start getting better. By about the, the 20th treatment, they've almost plateaued. We, from a prophylactic perspective, what we do is we do about 20 treatments, OK? before. Uh, surgery. They have their surgery. We do 10 more to help with wound healing and more when you uh, uh, vascularization. You can see that by the time you get on the flat part of the curve, about to about 30 treatments or so, you don't see any additional improvement. Hence, why we use a total of 30 treatments. And the break in the line here is because of follow-up. They followed these patients for several years, and they basically sustained that neovascular that that vessel growth. Okay, and didn't lose it. So that's what you're measuring with that transcutaneous. You're actually Measuring the, the, the oxygen vessel, tension in tissue. The, well, the vessel, actually, the vessel growth, but that's a proxy for how much. Yes. That vessel growth. Yes. Okay. Yeah, the, the vessel growth was demonstrated in a rabbit model. Right. Okay. Uh, we can get tissue up to about 80% of normal, okay, uh, by using hyperbaric oxygen. In previously irradiated tissue, we don't do this to the normal tissue. Uh, once we get vessel growth, you get improved uh, cellularity. And the goal, some patients it's to heal wounds, but in these other patients it's to prevent wounds. Or, uh, and a lot of times we don't, like with uh, radiation cystitis and proctitis, we may not fix the problem 100%, but we fix it enough to where their quality of life improves us significantly, and they're very happy patients. Cerebral abscess is another one that I won't go into because it's just not worth talking about. Okay? They're very rare. It was based on some uh, uh, case reports in the literature. I believe it works. However, these are some very rare extenuating circumstances that are, are quite unique. Next. Uh, some of the experimental uses. This one is about to become an approved criteria based on research done here uh, at, the, uh, at the Air Force Base, central retinal artery occlusion. The problem with this is getting into the chamber early enough after their, their, their insult. Okay, if they come in and they had visual loss a week ago, can't help you. But the ones that, that, that we've been able to, to get excellent outcomes in have been the ones who come in that morning. And see, you know, I woke up this morning, I can't see. Uh, and we got excellent outcomes. And that data is very good. Uh, I was one of the first people to uh, recognize and report the uh, bisphosphonate-induced osteonecrosis uh, and published a, a case series. Uh, I'm not sure if, I, if hyperic oxygen therapy can help uh, in this particular entity. They're doing a study at Duke right now. Uh, which is where I was when I fell upon it, uh, to see if it helps or not. It will be interesting. And of course, I mentioned earlier... Does that, that occur in all bones or mostly just in the, in the facial bones? There? I've, I've only the seen it in the facial bones. And, and, the way, and the way I came across it is we were getting patients sent by dentists for, ironically, chronic osteomyelitis, which was the same thing that Dr. Mark saw uh -huh. 30 years prior. Thing, some, and this bizarre entity. And, uh, but they weren't responding the way that our normal patients did. So I just started looking through their records and realized that, you know, all of these patients with the chronic osteomyelitis of the jaw that aren't responding, they're all on a bisphosphonate. And that's how it, came, that's how it just came up. I, it was not that I'm a genius, because it's a far from it, but it just stumbled upon it. And we're doing some research now with acute uh, a brain injury uh, and uh, hyperic oxygen therapy. We'll see. Uh, We've got a big DOD study funded, like 10, 10 or so million dollars, $20 million. We've got a, it's not kicked off yet, 
it's going to be a multi-site study across the country, and then we've got a small study going on at Brooks right now. Uh, we're trying to enroll 40 patients. We're about halfway done with with, with our patients. It's it's all blind, so I have no idea what the data looks like. Uh, next, okay, boy, we're already probably gone too long. I don't have time to go into this, uh, but if, if anyone wants to stay later, I'm happy to stay. It's, I got you know three or four more slides to talk about. If you have any questions, uh, I'm here for you. Well, I have a bit down question. Um, my husband suffers from pernicious anemia, and he's been told by some people in the medical community that, uh, that this would be a good therapy for him. There's n no data to support that. That's what I thought. Thank you. <laughs> you see, we just don't treat everything. <laughs> Unlike some of our critics lot like to claim. Uh, any other questions? Sir, when you do prophylaxis <laughs> treatment, you said for 20 treatments, right? do you do 20 consecutive days before the surgery? Uh, it doesn't, uh, you know, it's funny you should ask. Initially, when Dr. Marx did the study, they were doing hyperbaric therapy, ox uh, hyperbaric, hyperbaric oxygen therapy six days a week. Uh, no, I'm sorry, seven days a week. They're doing every single day. And then the patients finally uh, re uh, revolted at one point, and they said, look, we can't take this. We need a break. Uh, so they start taking Sundays off, and, and the protocol became a six-day protocol, six days a week, uh, one treatment a day, uh, for ex for a total of 20 pre-op, 10 post-op, prophylactically, or if they had if they actually had frank osteoradionecrosis, uh, exposed bone, etc., uh, 30 treatments or 30 to 40 treatments. Um, since then, most places are only treating five days a week. It seems to make no difference. At Duke, where I trained, we're not doing one treatment a day. We're actually doing two treatments a day. And anecdotally, we seem to get very comparable uh, results. We just finish in half the time. Uh, and for a lot of patients, for example, in Texas, we have a disproportionately large number of hyperbaric oxygen therapies throughout Texas. In San Antonio, probably even higher, you know, if, if you look at the number of chambers. Uh, it, it's really, it's, it's an impressive number. When I was at Duke, we were basically kind of a referral for all of North Carolina, parts of Southern Virginia, parts of you know South Carolina and Tennessee. Okay, so patients came from far away, had to be away from their families, away from their work, had to be put up in a hotel. It was a big inconvenience. So part of our protocols was to try to minimize, you know, uh, expenses and time away. And, and we treat twice a day versus once a day. And again, our, our, our results there were very very comparable to what they get elsewhere with once a day treatment. Any other questions? Okay. Thank you, Colonel. Oh, and my you pleasure. just returned from Nicaragua? Honduras. Honduras, yes. He spent a year managing a medical facility in Honduras. So he's really just getting cycled back in. So we're glad you're here. Oh, my pleasure. Thank you. Thank you for inviting me. I need your evals.